I grew up splitting my childhood between two places, Berlin, where my mother's family came from, and Edinburgh, where I grew up, both of which were heaving with history in the most extraordinary and dramatic way. Formally, history started to be something I became professionally involved with, really with the sort of television programmes that I started making. In the first instance, biographically informed, I worked on a series called Reputations, and those studies, usually of extraordinary 20th century lives, germinated as an interest in history, which was then consolidated over the five years I spent working with Simon Sharma on the history of Britain. I'm going to take the word front on that this lecture started with, packaging. I'm a packager. I'm the yellow box warehouse on the ring road out of the university town, and I'm very, very proud to be one. I always think the question to ask about packages is, well, what lies inside them? Is it a much desired present or just a handful of styrofoam chips? The thing about British history is we've got so much of it. We're not a country based on a creation myth. So we're not Australia, we're not the United States. We're a country drowning in the bloody stuff. Wherever we look, it goes back at thousands and thousands of years. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a fascinating selection of such packages in the history area that have been commissioned and transmitted on the BBC over the last wee while. However, the only map you could hold in your head at any one time, pockets of it. So it's a bit like the underground map, the tube map in London. You pop up in Piccadilly Circus, you pop up in Green Park, but you have no idea what connects the two. ATV presents an experiment. Can a brilliant historian talking about a fascinating subject Hold the attention of a television audience of millions for half an Television hour. is a big, powerful broadcast medium that, at its very least, draws in millions and millions of people. There is a question, and the answer lies with you. But of course, if you go back from Homer to Shakespeare to Hollywood, where do they look for their most extraordinary stories? Well, events as understood, mythic or otherwise, and it's as true today as it was then. Ten months later, the same man was dictator of one of the greatest empires in the world. We can do all we like with our packaging, but one lesson I'd like to draw from this is one man standing in front of a badly drawn curtain in the Hippodrome Golders Green and a woman with an unchanging background. I tell you, in a week's time, you ask yourself which of the clips of this you remember, and I promise there'll be two of them. It's different, or a feeling that's, that's inside. which is almost indescribable because um, of, of, of literally what, what we'd gone through. The 1996-1997 moment when Plans for History of Britain were first mooted, it was inconceivable that you would do two things. One is tell a story that sounded as boring as what happened in Britain from way back then to way up now in such a kind of orthodox way. In 1348, London had a population of close to 100,000. And the second thing that felt odd about it was the tide had turned on the mega series. We didn't do things in parts of 13 or 26. That belonged to the previous ages of Kenneth Clark and Jacob Bronowski. And surely we were more fleet of foot than that. In the first wave of the plague, 300 died every day. But there exists out there enough audience curiosity to sustain this great beer moth of a project. And once you've stimulated that curiosity and tried to gratify it by telling the story through a chronological structure but thematically interwoven, it became very engrossing and by the end of it I couldn't imagine doing it any other way. If we part on these terms, we shall not meet again in this life and the royal temper flares up. I just thought the genius of the series was to ask the question, what does it look like when you put everything in order? Which started off life feeling like the least interesting thing you could do and ended up being the most interesting thing. On January the 30th, 1649, the English killed their king. But over and above that, it was to draw out of that chronology major themes that characterise our island's story. It had happened before, of course, all those Edwards and Richards violently done in by their own subjects. The various 
centres of gravity around which great historical events and personalities shaped and formed themselves and the great moments of both continuity and discontinuity, the great watershed moments, moments of conflict and things falling apart. So it was a story as much about entropy as it was about national coherence. And it was along the way to test a few national myths. The sense that God had some special service for him made a new man of Cromwell. He knew where he was going. He knew what had to be done. I'm a broadcaster, I'm a synthesist, I'm the second order. I take the stories, the research, to translate them into a form where I think three million people might not just want to see them, but, but, but derive huge value from them. So I'm in the business of taking less and less and offering it to more and more, not more and more and offering it to less and less. Can I interest you in a nugget? Yeah, all right then. From that point of view, while I have vast respect for the worlds of research and the creation and the collation of primary data, I absolutely understand my limits. My limitations are I'm very good at taking your stuff and turning it into stuff that my mum might want to watch. Daniel Defoe stopped off in Stilton, where he had cheese brought to his table with maggots around it so thick that a spoon was brought for him to eat them with. However, the internet offers a vastly greater number of opportunities for pitching levels of content, for size of content, for content that leads on from simple to complex. And the doors are open to all sorts of contributors, not least academics. What is absolutely at the heart of my ambitions as a commissioner going forward is that we have available to us this extraordinary burgeoning power of the internet, which will help us do what at the moment I can only do over a finite number of hours in very expensive and often cumbersome form on television. The internet generation consume five things simultaneously. They segue from one to the other without batting an eye. So if we can adapt and adopt our knowledge strategies to those kind of models, the ideal result just might be we speak to audiences for whom television or the book are not first and foremost the only ways in which they consume knowledge. I'm no longer a television commissioner. I don't think television. You know, in the same way the American railroads realised they're not in the business of railways, they're in the business of transport. I'm in the business of ideas and content, and I will ensure that the strategic choices we make will be mirrored and emboldened and fleshed out in what we do on the internet across all our platforms. Mm -hmm.